Hallelujah. Glory to God. And blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. It's made it possible for us to be in His presence, enjoying fellowship with Him. And when we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. What a blessing to be in fellowship with Him. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So I uh, welcome you as across the nations, this is Liberty House International Church. We are coming to you all the way from the USA. And uh, you're watching us live by way of YouTube and uh, Facebook. In case you miss any portion of this live stream, please go to our webpage, libertyhouseusa.org. Once again, libertyhouseusa.org. Or go to our YouTube channel and type in Liberty House International Church. You can treat yourself to the videos we have uh, online. All right, so my mission here is to push you forward. I'm not against you, I'm for you. So you can advance in your walk with the Lord. Uh, my unique, uh, I have a unique way of delivery. So in case I say something that doesn't resonate with you, please don't pick up the fight. I'm not here to be condescending. I'm for you once again. You are a child of God and I treat you as such. I'm an agent of change and transformation, a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's go into the word of the Lord. And we're going to go starting from, uh, uh, what's the name? Genesis chapter 16. I'm starting from that place because it's the book of beginnings. So let's start from Genesis 6, 16. We'll read from the very first verse. Now Sarai, Abrams, it's not Abraham. Notice it's not Sarah. It's S-A-R-A-I. And then Abram, A-B-R-A-M. So, so now Sarai, Sarai, Abraham's wife had uh, borne him no children. We are reading from Genesis 16, from verse 1. And she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. So that was the servant or the maid of um, uh, what do you call Sarai. So Sarai said to Abraham, the husband, See now, the Lord has restrained. Whoa. Is that possible? The Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And uh, Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave Lola, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham to be his wife. After Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar. We are in verse 4. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abraham, My room be upon you. I gave up my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and I. So Abraham said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now I can continue to read. But I want to, you know, cut it here. Now, I want you to understand what is going on here. Sarah had a need. Sarah, who became Sarah, his, his name was changed because the Lord said, you are going to give birth to a son and the Lord mentioned the name or gave the name of the son Specific son, he shall be called Isaac, for he shall be the covenant is 
go to take place between him and I. He's going to be your seed. Hallelujah. So when this promise was not fulfilled, or it was shortcoming, um, they tried to help God, as it were. They tried to help God. And uh, everyone deals with something like that. We all have desires, we all have goals, we all have uh, some expectations, we have dreams and we have visions. And at times, these things, the fulfillment, they don't happen quickly for us. Because according to our estimation, according to our judgments, according to our plans, according to our timetable, certain things should take place at certain times in our lives. But we forget that the one who has ordained times and seasons is the Lord who created us. So before we go into a place of frustration, because what we are pushing for doesn't take place at the time that we expect or we want, we have to consult with the one who controls time and seasons. And to find out his purpose concerning us, and what time, what season he has ordained for us to come into what we have to come into. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, it says to everything there is a season. Hallelujah. And a time for every purpose under the sun or on earth. So his timing is key. His timing, God's timing is key. In the first place, when you were born or your parents were thinking about having you, they might have had, they might have had plans for you, but before God permitted you to be born or allowed you to be procreated, he also has his plans. And we know that some parents, they don't even consult with God. They don't talk about God. They think, oh, I have a baby. I know what to do with this baby. And they go ahead. They have their timetable, their calendars, and that, and blah, blah, and all these things that they want to do. And uh, at certain times, some of the parents want things, dreams, and they have for their children, desires that they have with their children, for their children are not really in line with the will of God. It's not in line with the purpose of God. But now, we go into pushing to do things by our own strength. Isn't it, isn't it amazing that God kept assuring Abraham that, yeah, you are going to have that. Let's go to chapter uh, what, 17. Chapter 17, Genesis. Let's read from verse 1, so we're getting well. When Abraham was 99, 17 1. Okay. So when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Notice the name is still Abraham. He was then now 99. He spent 10 years. He didn't see anything, I mean, in the land. And that is why he said, okay, let's use our name. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Let's read on. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Let's read on. And I want us to feel this. He said, I'll, mul I'll multiply you exceedingly. Abraham really is thinking about. You know, material stuff, he's talking about goods, then he's talking about what? Children. Up to now, I just have one child. How are you going to multiply me, make me that great, whatever? Then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. And at times, this is what happens. God speaks to us. He speaks according to his, uh, what do you call it, knowledge. He speaks according to his wisdom. He speaks according to his purpose. He, speak, he speaks according to his counsel concerning our lives. And because he's God, and uh, we are yet to catch up, you know, with him at his level, his thoughts, and uh, his uh, what, ways, 
There are certain times when he speaks, we think we understand, but we don't understand. So I always tell people, whether you understand or not, agree with him. Because God loves you, and his thought for you is good. When he leads you, he's leading you for good, to profit you, to prosper, to benefit you. So you have nothing to lose. All right? You can trust him blindly, whatever. You can do that, because he's never going to harm you. All right, so as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be a father of many nations. Next verse. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. Notice the change of name. God himself said it. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, father of many nations. That's what it means in the English. For I have made you a father of many nations. And I want you to note the last sentence. God said, I have made you. He said, I'm going to make you. He said, I have made you. Something that we call the our past tense of God's word. You see, he has done it. He's not going to do it. It's done. Now, so for Abraham, this is confusing. I have made you a father of many nations. And it's like, okay, where is the child now? I don't have any child. You know, and he goes on, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make uh, nations of you. Kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations. And on and on and on and on, he kept going. And then he, in verse 10, he says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and your descendants after, uh, after you, every male child, among you shall be what? Circumcised. Now, the captain of the uh, Israeli, verse 11. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your four sins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, when you read this, you realize that in Galatians, it talks about circumcision. That is not of the flesh, but of the spirit. So this was a type. That's why I said, when you read the Old Testament, you have to interpret it in the light of the new, and then it makes sense. So this was a type, okay, that will happen in the time of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Okay, so like God said, I have made you. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at us, you and I. He, God has already made us. Before we even conceived in our mother's wounds, he has already made us. If you were going to be uh, an influencer, or impact, let's say, like this, I'm just using that as analogy. Like, uh, what, 10,000 people. He has structured you, he's made you that way. If you're going to uh, influence, uh, what, 20,000, he's made you that way already. If you're going to be in some kind of nation to do a work there, he has wired you to be that way. He's put all those desires, the leading, whatever. Is there? Now, we evolve into, or we discover, these things that God has already established about us. The way to do it is to have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. When you don't come into a relationship with him, you are not going to know that. When you come into a relationship with him, it's not just that. Then you stop there. But you have to continue to follow him. So he continues to lead you, and then he continues to reveal himself, reveal his uh, uh, plan. You know, to you, reveal his purpose and you continue to follow him that. That's the way it is. Most people fall short. A lot of people are believers, too, or many people are believers, but yes, so they struggle. Some are still saying, I don't know what God wants to do with me. I don't know the plan of God for my life. You know, and nobody is going to tell you that. Even though God can show it to some people, you have to seek the Lord. You have to wait on the Lord to realize that. And we are going to talk about this word, wait, because that's one word that also has been um, taught in some kind of, okay, erroneously, let me put it that way. So we are going to look at that. Now, I'm taking you to verse, uh, chapter 15. I'll start from verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I'm taking you back. All right, it's for a purpose. I am your, your shield, your exceeding great reward. And as I'm talking to you, I want you to be mindful of things that you have pushed for, 
that they have not seen results. Prophecies that they have received. Dreams. Some people, they say, well, God talked to me in dreams. Some of the dreams that you have had, you prayed about it. You know, uh, what yourself you picked up, you know, from the Lord and stuff like that. Your own, uh, let's say, dream and what have you. And so, it's not happening. I have a word for you, so let's, let's continue. Two, but Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, saying I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Now, when you read the Bible in chapters, it flows. But it takes time from chapter to chapter. Some is flows, some it may take different years. All right? And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abraham and to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who comes from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look, now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to, to number them. And he said to him, So shall the descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He believed the Lord. Hallelujah. And he counted that to him as righteousness. Now, I don't want to continue to read. I can take you to chapter 18, chapter 21, where you see some of these things. But I think this is a popular, um, what do you call it, story that everybody knows. So I'm going to write on that. So specifically, he said, your Sarah will give you. <laughs> I mean, I like the way God does his stuff. Hallelujah. He says, Sarah, your wife, is the one who is going to give birth. To a son, your descendant that I'm referring to. Hallelujah. And in his time, he did it. We know the son, when you read Romans chapter um, 4, you know, he believed God. And he was in a place where it didn't look like it was going to happen. Where Sarah uh, now has entered into a period in her life, facing a life that conception was, you know, gone. He himself was weak. His, his body, he referred as good as dead. But when God wants to do something, what I have realized is this. He will bring you to the end of yourself. I'm saying something here. Before God does whatever he wants to do for you, something specific, something particular, his desire, his purpose of your life, he will bring you to the end of yourself. The more you struggle to prove yourself for the, to the Lord, that's what happened in the uh, era, dispensation of law. He was proving to them that, look, you can't please me, you can't serve me by your own might. You know, so you, he will allow you to do all your skirmishes, your screamings, and uh, your whatever, strategizing, and moving forward, and you know, moving this and moving that, bringing this person the picture, that person the picture, connecting to this person, connecting to that per person. You get exhausted in the process. You realize that nothing is working. May I tell you why people are frustrated? This is it. They don't allow their maker to lead them. Because when he leads you, he leads you to the right place. Now, for instance, when um, there was going to be farming the land, Isaac, Genesis 26, he wanted to move somewhere else. The Lord told him, no, stay here. And he stayed in that place he planted, he reached. I'm talking about the leading of the Lord. Then it also happened uh, to I I I Elijah. Elijah, there was funny. Then he said, you know, I'm going to keep you here. Stay at this brook. So he stayed there, he had water, he had rain, feeding. Now when the brook dried up, he said, okay, now Elijah, go to Zarephath. I provided the widow woman to take care of you. And at times I'm saying uh, that we come short of what God has for us because we are too quick to move. We are impatient. We want what we want and we want it now. Just like children do at times. And uh, we create monsters for ourselves. So the things are, you know, in our uh, hastiness, in our rush, we get into trouble. The title of this message is Don't Rush God. That's the title, Don't Rush God. Genesis 16, what we read, Ishmael was the result of what he did. And it was a painful experience. 
There's so trouble in this world because of that simple mistake. That simple move on your part to help God. I'm talking to you. Be patient. Hallelujah. Just be patient. And uh, God hasn't forgotten about you. You know, <laughs> One person said it this way, he used Bill, and then he used, uh, what was it, uh, Mercedes, years ago, the pastor was talking. He said, well, you know, I'm driving this Bill, you know, the vehicle Bill, and then everybody is passing me, it looks like uh, I'm late in life or whatever, but he said, you, you, you wait and see, very soon I'll be coming, you know, from behind, I'm going to overtake these guys with my Mercedes, that's how he said it. Hallelujah. Amen. Life is a race. Like he said in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run the race that is set before us. It's not a sprint. It's a lifelong kind of race. And you have to focus. That's right there. It says in verse 2. Now it says that let us what? Hebrews, Hebrews 12 2. What should we do? Fix our eyes. Look unto. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. But do we do that as Christians? At times we look at people, we put all our trust in them, like somebody says, you put all your eggs in one basket, you drop it, then that's it. You know, so we look up to these people, and then all of a sudden something happens. And uh, well, today I was talking to someone. I said, We heard this before. When people say that, okay, I don't go to church anymore. They are a bunch of hypocrites. I'm not, I'm not going to go to church. Why? Because somebody did something to them. And they think that everybody is like that. <laughs> so, such a person, I'll say that they are not looking unto Jesus. Yes, you have to look unto Jesus. Amen. Okay. So, now I'm going to bring you here into the New Testament. To understand what is going on, let's read uh, Galatians chapter 4. Let's start from 22. Thank you, Jesus. Galatians 4 22. Isaac is a son of promise. You all know that. Hallelujah. I, I like if you go home, you can um, read the whole chapter. But uh, for um, time's sake, I'm just going to um, take this. And for those who want to re reference to what I've been saying um, about God promising Sarah and Abraham to have their own child and not from somebody, a surrogate or whatever, you can find that in um, Genesis 18 um, from 10. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Hallelujah. Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. So this is specific. And I can say that some of us, we have received such specific, you know, words from the Lord. Hallelujah. And indeed, that happened. His name is Isaac. Amen. Amen. So we are going to read um, first, uh, Galatians chapter 4. So from 22, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. What well, we read in Genesis, that's why right, we read Genesis. So when I read this, you understand. He had two sons, the one by a bond woman, slave, that's Hagar, the maid, the other by a free woman, Sarah, the wife. It's important. Why would the Bible talk about this? Is it discrimination? No. It's bringing out the very counsel, the very wisdom, the very way of God. How God wants things done and what he was looking for. Hallelujah. In everything that God does, we have a part, we have a role. But what um, Sarah initiated and Abraham brought into it, to have uh, their maid, have a child for them. That wasn't the role or the responsibility God wanted them to play to see the fulfillment of his promise to them. 
So I, I want us to understand. When God says he's going to do something with you, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. There are things that he wants you to do, but he has to tell you what to do. You don't come up with something. And before I end this uh, lesson, I'm going to show you that from the word of God. Hallelujah. So let's read on verse 23 now. Galatians 4, 23. By he who was of the bond woman, Hagar, the maid, was born according to the flesh. And we know in John chapter 3, the Bible says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So this is natural. All right? And the uh, and uh, he of the free woman that Sarah the wife through what promise through what promise now let's start from 22 and have it in the new living translation you will appreciate it new living translation the scripture says the scripture says that Abraham had two sons one from his slave wife do you see the slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. Let's read on. The son of the slave wife was born in a human world, a tent to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the free wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. Now, the time between uh, the birth of Israel, the, 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 the son of the slave woman, and then, um, what do you call it? The son of the wife, Sarah, is 10 years. If you look at it, it's like a long time. Now, <laughs> as for God, his way is perfect. That's what the Bible says. As for God, his way is perfect. So then you ask yourself, what, what, what was all this about? Why would you keep me hanging in there, waiting for this long period of time, 25 solid years before God fulfilled his word? I mean, he could do it. He would have done it within five years. How come he didn't do it? He would have done it within the first three years of their marriage. He didn't do it. Even the first year of their marriage, he didn't do it. Okay, let's cut God some slack. After 10 years, give me, you know, my son he didn't do that. Well, what was it? Now, what is written is written for our understanding, what is revealed. But what is not revealed, we can bother ourselves about it. There's no way you are going to find out certain things why God, you know, didn't do it at the time that he wanted him to do it. Most of the time, in hindsight, we appreciate what we think or what we see as delay. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. And that what comes readily all the time is, you know, how God delayed the, uh, the birth of John the Baptist. Um, well, Elizabeth wanted a child, but delayed because John the Baptist had to be born at the time that Jesus also is going to be around so John the Baptist can be the forerunner. And that's what it is. We study Hannah's case where the, uh, her son Samuel was born. It's a similar kind of thing. So God has things planned out. Can we say this? The main picture. Most of the time we don't have the main picture. When we, when we look at a picture, there are a lot of things in the picture. But we can, we can look at a picture or we can look at a, 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 a photograph of somebody, a person, or a scene, and something, you know, is like draws us. You know, we we see that right away. It catches our attention. You know, we are drawn to it. You know, it stands out. That is just what one item or one. Well, what should I say? <laughs> one part or many parts of the picture. So somebody looks at a uh, photograph, a picture of uh, somebody and says, Ooh, I like the dress. Oh, I like the clothing. I like the color. 
Somebody is not looking at the color, he's looking at shoes. Somebody is looking at the hair, or he's looking at watch. He's looking at something. Now, all these are what? Parts. God always has the big picture. And like a puzzle, everything has to fit in the right place. So when he's working, he's working, taking into consideration everything relating to his plan, relating to his purpose. All the angels that come together for his purpose to be fulfilled, he's working on all of them. They all have to be on the same page. They all have to come together. They all have to embrace uh, this vision for him, this desire for him. So he's working on Steve. He's working on Jack at the same time. He's working on Sue and he's working on Sarah. And all these things are going. But because people have different level of understanding and perception, willingness to do what God wants them to do, it takes some time. Jesus, dealing with the disciples, he says, don't say that there are yet four months and the harvest will be ready. He said, lift up your eyes. They are already white. They are ready. Don't say there are yet four months. Now, when it comes to things that at times we ought to do, we procrastinate. Then we give it time. So they are saying there is yet four months. So, he says, now is the time. He groomed these people. And then what happened? When he was raised, he was passing them to go do the work. They all went back to fishing. And that's what we do at times. Because fishing was appealing to them more than reaching out to souls. And at times that's what we do. When we battle God, we are bombarding. Somebody said, the gates of heaven. Make this happen. Make this happen. Do this for me. It's all about me, myself, and I. It has nothing to do with the will of God. Nothing to do with the will of God. It's normally about ourselves. Me, myself, and I. And uh, I was talking to somebody and I said it. I said, yes, that's what I say. Yeah, people commit to foolishness. And it, I mean, if you want to see commitment, look at how. I mean, I'm giving you that. Go uh, do it. You see. You see how people commit to foolishness. What is nonsense? What has no. Uh, something like a fight. Somebody can make. Why do you have these gangs and whatever around? What, 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 what do they get? Killing people. What do you get out of that? You know, drugs only say that is too extreme. But look at some church people. Look at how they lead their lives. Some Christians. I know you have people like that in your family. Uh oh, okay. No. I mean, you don't have some people in your family. You have some people like that that you know. You know, but look at how they live. And you can tell that I don't understand why this person is living this way. So it's going to take some time for uh, God to keep working on this person till they yield their heart to his purpose. Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son. He left. He wasn't supposed to go, but he left. And all this while he was doing his foolishness, he was committed to that. He reduced himself to the point of eating, eating uh, animals' food. It's amazing the things that we inflict, the pain, the trouble that we invite into our own lives. Because we want to do our own thing. That reminds me of a time many years ago. Um, is it now? Before, before twenty, uh, before two thousand three, this person uh, passed the nursing kind of uh, degree, registered nurse. Passed. Now she was to write for the exams. She kept failing three times, and I was talking to her because then she was uh, part of our church. And I was talking to her. I said, look, this thing, because she spoke to me, and I know she suffered injustice where she was coming from. So the thing was like, okay, I'm going to do this and, and, and show them, you know, that yes, I've done this to prove the point. And I said, so far as you keep thinking that way, it's not going to happen. Three solid times, she didn't pass the certification. She changed before she passed, and she enjoyed some good money. Some of you are missing the name, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, so that is it. Why would I also went through something bitter? And I remember one advice that somebody gave me. And the person said, You know, just do this to prove to him that what? Whatever he's trying to do against you is not working. And I said, I don't have time even for him. I'm not thinking about him. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just minding my business. What God has given to me to do. I'm going to work on that. 
That's it. And how many I'm saying this to for you to understand that we have a lot of Christians. They will not be saying it, but it's in their head. It's in their heart. And all their toiling, their labor, their effort, their energy that they put out there is to prove something to somebody. Is to is to what what does it mean? To have an exclamation mark. You know, the angel of whatever, whatever they are doing. And that is not okay. You are living your life for that person, but live your life for God. Hallelujah. You see, if their word matters to you so much, and you keep their word in your heart, like you keep a treasure, then every day is ringing in your ear. Every day is boiling like hot water in your heart. And that is what is driving you. You miss it. You miss it. They are not that important as God to you. Their word is not that important. And doesn't carry weight like God's word. So you talk to some people, they can tell you exactly when whatever happened, happened. You know, whoever did that to them and uh, what they went through and all that, you know, they will take that. But if you ask them, John 3.16, they can seal that out. So the unbelieving mind always locks into that which is negative. That's why I keep saying the Bible says in Ephesians, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You have 24 hours to deal with stuff, confront it, and let it go. Hallelujah. Let not the sun go down on your anger. That was another thing I was going to say. And then when you, when you read uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, what does it say? Love does not keep record of wrongs. Wow. What, do we, what are we doing to ourselves? You know, some of us, if we have stepped into a position of power, authority, would have uh, annihilated, would have killed some people, would have eliminated them, would have uh, stopped their business because they did us dirty, they wronged us, they offended us, we suffered injustice through them, and so we are going to do it for them. We are going to revenge. You see, God waits for us to come to a place. I'm going to say something that is deep. So when you read uh, James chapter 1, let's go to James chapter 1. So one was human attempt. Please, don't do anything. I'll show you in the Bible what he asks people to do. Peter, for instance, he didn't decide that I'm going to cast, let down the nets. He did that because the Lord said, do it. That's why I said, never be less. Look to the fact, never be less at your way. I'll let down the net. And he did. That's what I'm talking about. There's labor, there's work, there's effort. That comes from the word of the Lord. When the Lord speaks to you, he tells you exactly what to do. The work that you're going to do, whether mentally, physically, or spiritually, whatever, it comes from what he says to you. Like he told Elijah, Elijah, go to Zarephath. There's a widow that I provided there to take care of you. He had to go. That is work. The going is work. Accepting what God has said is work. That is how God works with us. Hallelujah. Okay, so from uh, verses James, we'll read 2 and 4. 2, 2, 3, and 4. 3 and 1. Hallelujah to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, we are reading the New Living Translation. Troubles, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When troubles come your way, and Jesus said it, that in this world you have what? Troubles, tribulation. So why, why do we have troubles? Why do troubles come our way? Is to get rid of our own way, our own thoughts, our own desires, our own dreams, to move us from our selfishness 
to become God or Jesus Christ centered. That's why the Bible says you renew your mind. You renew your mind with the word of God. Hallelujah. And a lot of Christians have strongholds, according to the second um, second word, the second Corinthians chapter 10 from 3, the weapons of our Father can remind you to go to the pulling down of strongholds. Yeah, stronghold is a way of thinking, a line of thinking, belief system, way of doing things that is not of God. It doesn't line up with the will of God, the will of God, the word of God. It can be a result of our upbringing, people that we hang around, churches that we have attended, local assemblies, that teachings are wrong. And I know some of you have experienced that before. You know, so the first time that the light came on is the same Bible that you know they use, but they bring worship. The same Bible, but they misinform you by misinterpretation and misapplication. So when you use the same Bible and the right, you know, kind of interpretation and application comes out, it's like, wow, I didn't know that. We all had that kind of wow moment. And it's going to continue because we are all work in progress. Hallelujah. So when you have that kind of wow moment, what happens? You abandon the way that you are used to. The kind of personality, lifestyle, your conduct, the way you approach things, you drop that, and then you accept truth, God's way of doing it, and then you live your life. That's how simple it is. Hallelujah. And this is an ongoing process for every child of God. You have to continue to do this daily, I'm saying daily in your life. So you are going to be tested. That's a way, you know, I read what it says in the New King James Version. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Trials that mean temptations. That's the same. And then three says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. The trial of your faith produces what? Patience. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, why is God talking about this? We are not patient by our natural, when I say natural, I'm talking about biological, human nature. We are not patient. We are not. But God has to allow this test to go on so the fruit of patience will be demonstrated in our lives. Hallelujah. And when we talk about patience, what are we talking about? Hallelujah. We are talking about constancy. We are talking about constancy. Amen. We are talking about being in a place where you keep doing what you know is the will of God. You keep doing it. You don't stop it. I counsel people at times, you know what they say? Oh, well, I've been doing this uh, for, you know, six months now. I don't see any change. I don't think my sons is going to change. I don't see any change that is going to come. You see what they are doing? They are speaking unbelief. They said they've been working six months. So the six months that they've been working, it was a mental thing. It didn't come from their hearts. They were not convinced. They were not persuaded that it's from God. And that will bring about a change. And then they put a time frame on it. By the time I get to the six months, I should see some change. The six months, they don't see any change. And then they give up. Lack of what? Patience. My God wants us to be consistent. He wants us to be steadfast. Hallelujah. In uh, applying or working in His Word. He doesn't want us to let go of the assurance or the confidence that we have in Him. Hallelujah. So trials and testings, they come our way and then the fruit of what? Patience is the result of it. Hallelujah. Okay, so let me do this well. I told you already, trials, troubles, whatever it is. Trials, troubles, uh, temptation. Okay, normally it's about something connected. It can be something that is uh, associated even with pain. Okay? And when we go through trials, it's a time also of proving us. God wants to prove us. Proving meaning 
Let you be a source in the real you. Knowing who you are in Christ and what you should be doing as a result of that. And knowing that, look, this is where I am. I have to step up. It can also be an uh, enticement to sin. Trial of man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, constancy. Hallelujah. It's a condition of things, of a mental state by which we are enticed to sin or to elapse from the faith and holiness. It's adversity, it's affliction, it's trouble allowed by God, serving to prove or test one's character, faith, and holiness. It takes a whole nine hours. Do you know what we do normally? When we see trouble, we run away from it. So we think, okay, I'm part of this work, and this work, that's why I'm getting all these troubles, so I'm going to look for another job. We don't confront our challenges. Then you go to another job, and then you see that, okay, the same thing, because you take you to that same place, the only you might to that same place, and you begin to experience the same thing, and then you run away to another place. I'm not saying you shouldn't change jobs. There are times that you have to change because it's necessary, because what is going on is not okay. But just don't change us. Let me know you are run away from what you have to face. Okay, this uh, knowing this, the first three, is like some kind of knowledge that we walk in, awareness that we come into, and that is important. Knowing this, the trial. So knowing this, knowing this, you come to a place where you are sure you have knowledge, you perceive, you understand. That's one word that you can remember. And the word, stand. Understand this, that when you are being tried, when you are going through the trial of your faith, is to produce something. It works patience. It brings out what? Patience. Hallelujah. And I've given you the definition of patience, constancy, continuance. All right, you don't stop steadfastness. You keep doing it. That is character. Keep doing it. It's not something that you do today, tomorrow, and for a week, and then you stop. But you continue. The just shall live by faith. You continue like that way. Then in the verse of four, it says, "Let what? Let patience have its perfect work." Let it be uh, sound work, complete. As he said there, complete, lacking nothing. Now, the way to take care of the lack is for us to go through. Then as we go through what, how we are already wired with the virtues from God and downloads from God, then we come to a place where those things begin to show forth. Those things are what? Exercise. The virtues are used, they are put to use, they are practiced. And uh, as we continue to do this daily or time after time, then you come into a habit, it comes into a character, and then this is part of you. Hallelujah. Amen. And the fruit of the fruit of uh, the spirit, then you begin to show forth, manifest in your life easily without effort. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, we have to close. Okay, so let's read um Hebrews 10, 30, 35, 36. I don't want to dwell on this. I want to learn it well. So I can't break it down the way I want I plan to do it. Hallelujah. Look, I can tell you there are people that I've ministered to, and for years I've not seen some change. Some people it took years and the change happened. At times I wonder, and I keep asking myself, is it because I'm not believing God, so these things are not happening? Is it because they are not believing God? Because this is not happening? And I keep on wondering, what is going on? You know, but this is one way. Because you don't know what people think in their heart. You know, like I was giving the example. So I said, like six months, I don't see any change in this part of mine. I've done this for six months. They are not budging. So whatever you are doing, you don't believe it, and you are negating, negating whatever you are doing by your words. You are not speaking in line 
with what God expects you to do. I always tell people, God doesn't expect you to be nice for three months. And then when you see that the person is acting nice, then you change. He wants you to act nice, work in love for the rest of your life. And that's it. He wants you to be polite, respectful for the rest of your life. It's not saying do it for three months and change. No. So that's why we miss it. And then the very thing, the very situation, the very circumstance that will bring about that kind of uh, patience, the steadfastness, the endurance, and all that we need, we throw it away. So we position you with somebody in a relationship, somebody around you. It could be a workplace, it could be campus, school, it could be your home, your own sibling, your own parent, your own child, you know, it could be the church place, wherever. There's somebody in your life, and it can be like a, a thorn in the flesh, a pain in the neck. But it's in all this while, God is using these scenarios, the situation, to mold you, to shape you into the character that is all he has ordained for you. Because where he is taking you, you can't go with this nasty behavior, you can't go with this ugly conduct. You are going to mess up things for him. So Hebrews 10, 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. And uh, I will say that probably memorize this. Read that over and over and over and over. Do not cast away. Don't do it. Don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Uh, King James says recompense of reward. So recompense is the same as reward. Okay, let me break this down. Cast away mean what? Throw off or lose. So you say don't lose confidence. Wow. Don't lose confidence. And what is the confidence talking about? Assurance. Your confidence in Christ, your confidence in his word, your confidence in the promise what God has said, never lose confidence in that. That's what Abraham did. He, uh, he did it. Lose confidence. In Romans chapter 4, the Bible says he did not stagger at the promise of God. He was so weak in faith. He was strong in faith. Knowing that what he had promised, faithfully seeing that as has promised, he believed that. He was persuaded. Hallelujah. Assurance. Now, at certain times, when we think we waited three years, we're doing fine. Because whilst it was going on, the first time we said, oh, it's going to happen by the end of the year. Then it happened. Then we will encourage ourselves, oh, you know, by, by the middle of the next year, second year should happen. Then it doesn't happen. Then it gets to the third year. Then now it's like we lose it. That's it. Three years now, nothing is happening. Okay, I think I have to think about doing something else. No, 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 no. Stay there. He wants you to be what? Stable. He wants you to be fixed on his word. Hallelujah. Maintain that assurance. He says that assurance, that confidence, if you don't throw it away, it has great reward. That is payment of wages due. Now we know that when we work, we are not paid in the middle of the month. We are not paid in the middle of the week. We are paid at the end of the week and at the end of the month. That's it. So if we hold on to, just like we do our work, we go in there, uh, what, eight hours, you put in, or whatever hours, 12 hours, uh, 12 hours, whatever, you do that, and then at the end of the week, your week, your working week that's assigned to you, you receive, um, what do you call it, the reward, hallelujah. So don't throw that off your, your what? confidence, that's assurance. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Don't let anybody make you lose it. And at times, you know, if you, if you, <laughs> let me say it this way. Somebody around you, somebody that you love can make you lose it. Not just some circumstances or situation, but somebody you love, you're crazy about, can make you lose it. All right? So we have to be careful. Then uh, 36. It says, for you have need of endurance. We started in James chapter 1 talking about patience. Okay, endurance. Now it's here again. You have need of endurance, which is patience, constancy, or steadfastness. We're talking about perseverance. 
Some people can't stand anything. No. And they can go to a place, they even order their food, and they just can't stand that. It's taking this long to food or something. Just that. I mean, like one preacher said sometime back, he said, you turn on your own microwave, and you put that thing in there, you set a time on here, say, higher, 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 higher. You know this electronics, they run according to their own time. You can't rush them. Yeah. You know, so God uses situations, circumstances, and as well as people to make sure that we come to that place that He wants us to be. He refines us through that. So when you have need of patience, it says that, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And it takes such work in endurance, constancy for one. To even do the will of God. Let me say that again. Doing the will of God doesn't come cheap. Like you go to the store and then you, saw, you see something, oh, I like this, and then you pick it up, you swipe your card. Doing the will of God doesn't come that way. It takes endurance. When we talk about endurance, what are we talking about? Patience, constancy, or steadfastness, perseverance. For you to do the will of God. And when you do the will of God, then, of course, you're going to receive the promise. So wherever you are now, I'm encouraging you, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. I appreciate the people in your life that you think they are pain in their neck. God is using them to groom you. I'm not saying what they are doing is nice. I'm not saying what they are doing is fair. But God is using them. Some people will say, well, I used to Cuss like a sailor. Now I've stopped. What happened to you? Why did you stop? The people that, you know, you push your buttons and whatever, they are still around. You know, by now, you've renewed your mind. You know how to respond to whatever they're doing. Like I always say, you have control over you. You don't have control over people. What they are going to think, what they are going to say. And when you say something, you don't know how they are going to see it or how they are going to take it. You don't have control over that. But you have control over you. And I always say, don't give somebody power, control over your life. That they will sit somewhere like a remote control and they are controlling your life. Yeah. Don't let somebody's word matter or mean so much to you than God's word. Don't let anybody become so dear, so important to you more than Jesus Christ who died for you. I've done this for years, and this one, where I am, I always tap into the grace of God. I'm a male. He created me a male. I don't have to struggle to be a male. So if you're a Christian, you are wired to be who God has made you to be and to do what God has ordained for you to do. So you always have to choose him, God, choose Jesus Christ over everybody, every person. Always, all the time, daily basis. And uh, daily basis, all the time, choose truth, his word, yeah. over anybody's word. Yeah. You have to do this for yourself all the time. Yeah. You push yourself to do it. Grace is already in there, it's inherent. And uh, you can do it. If you tell yourself you will do it, I agree with God. I accept his word, that's it. It's like the seed that is sown on good ground, and it will produce fruit yeah. to the praise of his glory. Yeah. You don't have to fast. You don't have to pray. You know, somebody was telling us uh, something that happened. They were dealing with somebody and the person said, oh, okay, so have you forgiven me? Then the person said, I'm going to pray about it. And said, what? Going to pray before you forgive? No, you can just choose to forgive. The person said, thank God for the lessons that I received from the LHIC. Yeah, you know, so I told the person, you choose to forgive. Yes, it's an act of your will. You know how to pray, you know how to fast. But these are some of the religious things that are going on in some circles. Choose the word of God. It's already made clear. Choose it. Just say, I'm doing it. I commit to do it, and I'll do it, and that's it. Choose the word all the time. Yeah. Hallelujah. Not your feelings, the word. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, well, like I said, the title is Don't Rush God. Now look at your life where you are rushing God. And you know you can't rush him, so don't even try it. You can see it yourself. Okay, I'll end on that note. And thanks for tuning in. I love you dearly.
go with Jesus, you will always have the desired results. Amen.